to Scientific Drinking. My name is Moss, and tonight we're talking about the three new proposals that were selected by NASA for the new human landing system. Cheers. Now, as I mentioned, we're talking about those three proposals involving six different companies selected by NASA to develop the new human landing system concepts. Now, each one has its own benefits and disadvantages, and we're gonna go through those. Let's start with the first one, Dynetics. Now, Dynetics is a pretty well-established company. They've been around for a while, built a lot of satellites. In fact, they're even partnering with Maxar to build the PPE component of the Deep Space Gateway, which is still a thing, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, Dynetics' approach is a two-stage system where you have a descent and descent element that are combined into one, but you still have a transfer element. Now, that transfer element is just there to handle the delta V required to descend to a lunar polar orbit. After that, the descent element takes over, well, in this case, the combined descent and ascent element takes over, lowers it to the surface, and then lifts it up again. Now, Dynetics is a pretty safe bet. They've been around for a while, and they've shown off their capabilities, and as a Lido subsidiary as of 2019, they have a lot of financial backing and infrastructure to take care of something like a large project such as this. Now, some of the disadvantages with this approach is that it's relying on two launch systems that don't even exist yet, the SLS and the Vulcan. Now that's not anything new with these proposals. A lot of these proposals rely on systems that don't exist yet. And in fact, Orion relies on XLS exclusively. Some more disadvantages with the uh, Dynetic system is it has a lot of thrusters and it's gonna create a lot of dust, especially if there's no lunar landing pad or infrastructure in place to help land it. And that's, as we talked about before, dust is kind of a problem. In fact, I'm gonna do an entire episode on dust because you know, the scope of the problem and complications associated with lunar dust, it deserves a topic in itself. But some of the benefits of this system is that since it's in a combined descent and ascent stage, there's some of those moving parts that you don't have to worry about when you're talking about a three-stage system like NASA was initially expecting and what Blue Origin proposed in their national team. Now, some of you might be wondering, what are the benefits and downsides of some of these multi-stage systems? Why have so many stages to begin with? Why can't you just throw a starship at it? Well, that's one of the proposals, but some of the benefits of having such a multi-stage system is that every time you do a delta V maneuver, you're not carrying all that weight with you. It's the same thing when you're talking about launching a rocket from the surface to orbit. That's why you have so many stages, because every time you dump off the stage, you're dumping off mass that you don't need to push around. It's just a question of inertia. The same can be said for human landing systems. If you dump some of that mass off with every stage, every delta V maneuver, well, you don't have to carry that all the way down to the surface or all the way back up into orbit. But of course, it's a little bit wasteful in itself, right? That's a lot of engineering. And there's a lot of moving parts that come into effect when you're talking about disconnecting stages or even worse, explosives, because sometimes you blast these stages away. And every time you have any moving part or explosive or something, some kind of part that needs to operate in a very time critical manner, that's risk and you're adding risk to your mission. Speaking of risk, let's talk about the second proposal. That's SpaceX's Starship, which as we've seen recently has run into a little bit of a problem. In fact, the problem isn't really specific to Starship at all. We're talking about pressure containment problems. SLS is concerned about these itself. With the delay in the green run test that was supposed to take place coming up here pretty soon in early summer, uh, some of the concerns with the pressure testing and the amount of fuel that these large rockets can really hold comes into question. And we've seen Starship test and retest as they've changed and modified their design over time. And sometimes they fail. Now, of course, I have an entire episode on Starship and some of the issues that you could run into on Starship. So I'm just gonna put that link in the description below. And uh, I highly recommend you check that out if you're interested in Starship and wondering what some of the hurdles they're gonna have to run across in the future. Nevertheless, developing and landing such a large structure on the moon has its disadvantages. Of course, like I said before, when you're talking about a multi-stage system, you have the benefit of dumping some of that mass that you don't need back on the surface or in orbit or just disposing of it in some manner. And so you don't have to carry it around with every maneuver. Starship doesn't have that advantage. They have to carry around their entire single stage system all the way back to Gateway, to Orion, or back to Earth if that's where they're going. However, there are some benefits to Starship. One is that it can be used for a lot of things. SpaceX plans to use Starship pretty much as the de facto transportation system of the Earth, Moon, Mars trifecta. The benefit of investing in this is that you get payoff not just in moon missions, but in surface to orbit delivery systems, in Earth to Mars transportation systems, I mean, and in 
If Starship works, that's one hell of a payoff, but there's a lot of risk in developing something as big and complex as Starship. And the little bit of funding that they got, that 130 so million, probably isn't gonna cut it for a lot of Starship development, but it is some much needed help in their quest to develop such a large and reliable system. Now item three is Blue Origin's national team. Uh, now I say Blue Origin's national team, but of course it's not owned by Blue Origin, but they are the prime contractor. The other three prime contractors uh, that they are associating with are is Lockheed, Northrop, and Draper. Now Blue Origin is building just the descent stage. Lockheed is building the descent stage and Northrop is building the transfer stage while Draper's worrying about the guidance, navigation, and control, and basically the integration between the three stages. And that's gonna be key. I've worked on some systems that were developed by multiple contractors just during my time in the Navy, and sometimes that really doesn't work out too well. Uh, the integration, the way they talk to each other, sometimes just is a little bit below par. And it's going to be a challenge to get all of these contractors to work together in the same way. And that's some of the problems we're facing with Gateway too. Now the national team has kind of a more safe and traditional approach, at least from NASA's perspective, because NASA was kind of expecting this kind of transfer element, descent element, and ascent element, three-stage system to mate with Gateway. And it's exactly kind of what we were expecting. So by the national team submitting this proposal, it kind of aligns very well with the long-term goals of NASA and the Deep Space Gateway in general. However, that's not to say that the Gateway is the only way to get people on the surface of the moon. In fact, Gateway's been kind of a divisive topic, right? I mean, people have thought that Gateway isn't really necessary at all. Well, it depends on what the, the scope of your picture is. But back to the topic at hand, are these missions going to use Gateway? Well, that's a little bit still up in the air. We, we're not quite sure if they're gonna be using Gateway or if they're gonna be going straight to the lunar surface. Both are possible. In fact, NASA's solicitation for the human landing system explicitly said that you don't need to use the Gateway way in your proposal to get humans to the surface of the moon. And that was kind of a big game changer, a lot of uncertainty around Gateway at the time, but NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine explicitly stated the importance of Gateway in NASA's long-term commitment to a sustainable approach to lunar architecture and human presence on the moon. So Gateway seems like it's pretty concrete at this point. It has a lot of funding and a lot of contracts have been issued. The human landing system is just the third part in, in continuing NASA's commitment to the Gateway. So it is of my opinion, and granted I may be a little bit biased here, that Gateway is gonna be around to stay. I certainly hope so. Uh, my current job depends on it. So who's your favorite out of these solicitations? Who do you think is gonna do the best? Granted, SpaceX is probably the, the crowd favorite in general, but do you really think that architecture is the safest bet? Do you think they're gonna to get to the moon with Starship in 2024? Or do you think something like Dynetics approach is a bit less complicated and more straightforward? Perhaps Blue Origins ambitious innovation might be the key to delivering humans to the surface of the moon by 2024. That being said, money doesn't seem to be a big motivator for Blue Origin in general, right? They have Jeff Bezos to rely on and constant stream of funding coming in through investment. So thanks for watching. Uh, tune in the next episode where we tackle something new. I guess we'll find out, right? Cheers. In fact, NASA's solicitation for the human landing uh, for the human landing system for the human landing system explicit system explicit. Uh, I really can't say this for the human landing system explicit explicitly. In fact, NASA's solicit Frederick Jim Bridenstine is uh, specific Frederick Jim Bridenstine explicit.